Or welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Okay. So five, four, three, two, and one. Our folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Judith Blackstone. Judith, welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So Dr. Blackstone is a founder of the realization process, a method method of embodied psychological and relational healing and non-dual spiritual awakening. She teaches workshops and teacher certification trainings throughout the U.S. and online. She's the author of several books, including The Fullness of the Ground, A Guide to Embodied Awakening, Trauma and the Unbound Body, The Healing Power of Fundamental Consciousness, as well as The Enlightenment Process, Belonging Here, A Guide for the Spiritually Sensitive Person and the Empathic Ground. Uh, Judith, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So before we get going here, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. I live in uh, Woodstock, New York, upstate New York. Uh, I... I guess I grew up in Brooklyn and uh, spent my early adulthood in Manhattan and then moved up here uh, quite a few years ago. Okay, awesome. So how did this start for you? How did this interest, this passion um, start for you? Well, uh, many years ago, I was a professional dancer uh, in Manhattan, in, in New York City. Actually, I've been uh, performing since I was nine years old. And um, when I was 25, I injured my back quite severely and wasn't able to dance. And um, I, of course, I thought my life was over. Uh, I had put quite a lot of quite a lot of work into that. And um, so I lived in a dance studio in a loft in downtown Manhattan. And I um, I was really quite injured. But I had people coming to the loft to take dance classes with me because that's how I made my living. So uh, I lay on the floor and just really prayed for for healing. I had, of course, gone to many body workers and doctors and so forth, and uh, nothing helped. In fact, some of the things made it quite a bit worse. Mm. Uh, so little by little, I began to get these very subtle these very subtle experiences, these inklings of a more subtle way that we can attune to ourselves, that we can actually get even deeper, more subtle level of attunement to ourselves than any sort of injuries, either psychological or physical. And since I had people coming to the loft to study with me, um, I began to teach them these very subtle attunements that I was finding, that I was experimenting with. And uh, and that was good because it meant that the the work at the very beginning uh, developed not just for my own according to my own problems but uh, on on a number of different bodies and, and beings uh, and then it just it just kept developing from there. Uh, what type of dance, dancer? Modern modern dance. Modern dance. Okay. And what happened to your back? How were you injured? <laughs> Well, uh, I have a, a anyway a dislocation that I was probably that I was born with or that happened at birth, uh, scoliosis and something a little bit worse, uh, where the the vertebrae are forward on the sacrum. And um, when I was twenty five, a woman named Pina Bausch, who actually was quite a well known choreographer, came to our dance company, the Pulse and Starter Dance Company, and she put me. Uh, in a position uh, that exactly mirrored the distortion in my back, which actually I'd been working with quite well for for years. But having to hold that uh, distorted position for a while uh, then brought the spine much further out of out of position. It had been what we call a, a a well-balanced, well-compensated scoliosis where my head was mm. over my sacrum. And now, now it wasn't. Um, and then um, I had a sp spine surgery where they actually fused me in that off-center position. 
So then I was really, really, really in trouble. And, um, you know, I was just held in that I couldn't even, it was hard to walk in a straight line. Oh uh, so I had quite a lot of work to do on myself. And um, and that was that was the beginning of the work. I realized that I had to go through many, many levels of uh, of inward contact with myself in order to begin to bring everything back into back into alignment. And of course, as these things often are, it was a really a, a saving grace that this happened because I wound up in a much a much better place, both in my own body and and in my life. So you you, you talked about these kind of uh, attunements, and you used another word. I forget what it was. These kind of in gradation. And yeah, talk, what is that? Talk. Be specific. What are you talking about when you say that? Well, so two things: the inward contact uh, with oneself is really uh, the ability to live within one's body. Interestingly, we don't actually live within our bodies. Most of us live a bit in front of ourselves hmm. um, be- for many reasons, partly because we grew up, grew up in that kind of pattern of relating that we feel like we have to come out of ourselves in order to really reassure the other person that we're making contact with them or, you know, this is passed down from generation to generation, that sort of relational style. But it's mostly because in reaction to abrasive events in our life from day day one or before that, which of course are, are unavoidable, that some things are going to be a bit unpleasant, too unpleasant to really take in altogether, uh, we we actually um, harden ourselves against experience. We shut down our heart just a little bit. For most of us, we, you know, we we constrict against uh, any sort of sexual harassment or even being touched in in an unpleasant way. Might might be certainly well intentioned, uh, but for the for the young child or for the baby, it's it's not tolerable. So we start to heart, constrict our body, and in that constriction. It blocks our ability to actually live fully within the body. So a lot of the, the psychological aspect of the realization process focuses on finding the focuses on finding those constrictions, releasing them. We have we have a technique for doing that in the realization process, and then inhabiting the body more fully. And the interesting thing is that the more fully we inhabit our body the more open we are to the world around us. So that inward contact with ourselves is exactly the same as openness and responsiveness, fluid responsiveness emotionally in every way uh, to the world around us. So it's a process of regaining ourself in that way. Uh, and now the attunement is that as we do that, our actually our perception becomes more more refined, more subtle. Instead of seeing just the surface of things, we have the sense that we can see deeply within them, especially people or animals, right? that we're not just connecting surface to surface, but we're actually attuning uh, in a more subtle way to the world around us and to our own being. So we get to a more subtle, I'm going to use the word dimension, but I don't mean in a hokey way, we, we get to a more subtle level of mm-hmm. our being, right? Uh, and that most subtle level of our being, which I call fundamental consciousness, is an undivided level of consciousness that we can actually experience pervading our whole body and pervading and even pervading the world around us so that everything appears to be both solid, you know, made of the stuff that we're made of, and at the same time made of this very, very subtle pervasive space consciousness. And that's that's how that's how the realization process becomes a technique for non-dual realization. So it's both a psychological healing, a relational healing, uh, an embodiment technique, but primarily it's a way to experience that oneness when we when we uncover that undivided space of consciousness pervading our own being and everything around us. Um, uh, this is really fascinating to me because I don't think I've ever talked about this 
to, in this way uh, on this podcast. Um, so I'm very excited right now. Um, you, uh, this idea of living in front of ourselves to me is is really interesting. I mean, it's it's a it's a very powerful visual, um, and I, I can feel what what that means. Hmm. Um, but I want to ask you, you know, you said when you got hurt, when you got injured, um, that became uh, almost like a, uh, an, uh, an opportunity for you. What were you doing specifically on for yourself? What, what, walk, walk us through that. How did that come about for you? Well, you know, that's a very, very long story. Uh, but it began with just lying on the floor, uh, really surrendering, uh, it, you know, giving, in a sense, giving up, you know, uh, the despair that, you know, I don't know, maybe you can only feel a 25 when you feel like, you know, that's it for you. And um, I just uh, lay on the floor and I realized, in, you know, after a while that if I actually dropped my weight to the ground, what felt like en- currents of waves of energy began to come up from the ground and move through my body and actually pull my spine into alignment. That was amazing to me because, of course, now, you know, in in our realm, we we know about, you know, in our community, we know about energy, but I was quite unfamiliar with it. So it was quite an interesting and uh, alarming and amazing experience for me. But really what was amazing was to feel that something natural, something just innate in, in the, in nature came uh, came through me and started to pull me into alignment, actually to center me, to heal me. So, uh, and that was something that then uh, years later, I found again uh, when I began to meditate that that we can just sit and open to to that current that mm-hmm. you know, that comes up and brings us deeper and deeper and deeper uh, within. And you know, the more centered we are. Here's another interesting thing. The more centered we are, the deeper we are. So mm-hmm. um, so that's how it started. That I mean, that was how it started, just lying on the floor and then, you know, knock on the door. It's five o'clock. My class is here. Uh, they want to learn how <laughs> they want to dance, you know, and I'm like lying there. And um, so I lay them all down and, you know, we all did these, uh, you know, open to these subtle experiences. So are we talking about accepting acceptance are we talking about use the word surrendering being open to our own experiences of, and what's going on that's definitely you know uh, actually you know crucial for the whole process you know if we don't accept where we are in the moment we can't go we can't go anywhere from there so yes that's certainly part of it now in the realization process we don't just open we don't just surrender we also do these very careful inward attunements which take a little bit of concentration not a whole lot but a little bit to focus deeper within so that when we do just let go of ourselves we don't let go from the surface of ourselves into the mm. space around us, but we let go from the internal depth of ourselves, right? And that's when we let go into that more subtle dimension, right? Fundamental consciousness. Otherwise, we're just kind of expanding energetically, mm-hmm. right? but we can actually focus and focus and focus until we can let go from that innermost core of ourselves. Now, when you start, started developing this when you started uh you know intentionally constructing this this process at what point walk us through when you said okay i want to work with people in this way utilizing this process how did that come about that also uh, took many stages and started out teaching dance. I, I'd actually been teaching dance for for years by the time I was 25. And uh, so I was already in a, in that kind of relation with people. Uh, people are very vulnerable when they when they're dancing, when they come to learn to dance, you know. Uh, so I already was in that sort of 
caring role with people. And then I um, I began to train as a body worker. I trained in Alexander Technique, but a very particular kind of Alexander Technique that was taught by a woman named Lydia Yohe, uh, which was uh, mostly table work and really, really her own uh, innovation on it. And um, so I did. I did this table work, body work, for well, I don't number of years, maybe five years, eight years. And I began to at the same time as I was teaching dance in my my loft. Um, I began to notice that people would feel great for a couple of days, and then they'd come back the following week and sort of be back where they were. And um, I wanted I wanted to go deeper with them. You know, they would also they would also go into emotional pain on the table and I didn't know how to how to deal with that you know my my family's way of dealing with emotional pain was to just keep busy you know that was always that was always the advice I got you know just keep busy you know uh, works for a lot so, of us <laughs> yeah right works for a lot. Works. or eat something right? <laughs> eat right. something <laughs> <laughs> so, so rather than that, I uh, began to train um, in uh, in psychotherapy. I did a three year training program, the Institute for Integrative Psychotherapy. Uh, Rebecca Troutman and, and um, uh, Richard Erskine. Uh, this was in the late seventies. We're talking about right a long time ago, and um, and that was actually quite a wonderful training uh, because we were like a group of twenty people. And um, we would work with each other, and Richard and Rebecca would give us feedback while we were working. You know, it was quite a good way, quite a good way to learn um, what worked and what didn't work, and so forth, and um, and to experiment in a in a safe space where we all felt safe there. So uh, so I did that training program, and then I I went into private practice, and um, and for a long time, I taught. The real, realization process it wasn't named yet, uh, and uh, and I did uh, psychotherapy, and then s- sometimes I would combine the two. In uh, 1987, I began to do workshops at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, and um, and that's when I realized the work needed a name. Mm. Uh, it wasn't yet the realization process; I had a different name for it, but it began to become a more coherent uh, sort of process. Uh, I, I began to realize that I could teach a sequence of practices for this kind of attunement um, for the workshops at Esalen. And so a lot of the work developed there. Okay. Let me just pause here for a moment. Um, we're speaking with Dr. Judith Blackstone. I just want to thank uh, our sponsors here. We'll be back in one second here. So, who would you say um, this this process is for? Well, it does take some sensitivity. Uh, you know, I mean, pretty much everyone who's come to do the work with me is able to. In fact, everyone is able to. They're even able to get that pervasive space, although it can take sometimes a little bit of practice. It can even take a couple of years. You know, sometimes people, you know, I'll... I'll go on and on about how this work actually pervades the furniture, pervades your body, and two years later they'll they'll suddenly turn around and look at me and say, you know, it feels like the space is going right through the furniture, <laughs> and I'm like, that's right, that's right. So it can take a little practice, and some people get it right away because they've they've always experienced something like that, and um, so uh, it's pretty much for anyone who who wants it, who who feels drawn to it or wants to feel deeper contact with themselves. The interesting thing is that when we live within the body, we have much more confidence. You know, there's there's actual that uh, sense of self-possession at the mm-hmm. same time as there's that transcendence into the self-other oneness. There's at the same time, because we're experiencing fundamental consciousness as the ground of our individual being, at the same time as it pervades everything around us, there's a sense of uh, self-possession. Like, oh, I take up space, I take up internal volume. And that goes a long way to helping with social anxiety. Many of the things that 
that sensitive people that sensitive people deal with feeling overwhelmed by the world around them and um and that that kind of thing because there's we actually feel the, uh, that we that we exist we we have a sense of our own existence it's hard to hard to explain in words but it's a it's a palpable feeling you know there there we are uh doesn't you know the word presence doesn't quite get it it's something a little more mysterious than that but we can feel our sense of existence uh and um and we feel uh as vital as other human beings as the world around us we no longer feel overwhelmed mm. what you're talking about almost seems to me to be like the antithesis of anxiety that's right yeah. um and yet it 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 seems uh, what you're talking about doesn't seem easy. It seems like it requires definitely some intentionality. I would even use the word courage too. <laughs> I mean, a, a full embodiment of who we are. Yes. Well, that doesn't happen overnight. It, you know, it, it's a very gradual price process, really. It's a, like a ripening inward mm. in a way. You know, we do the practice, you know, feel that you're in your feet, feel that you're in your legs, and, you know, and so forth. And then, you know, we can feel that for, you know, a few moments and then we lose it. And then we do the practice again. We get a little bit further. And then one day we're just there. So that's a gradual, gradual process. We don't open and and this is really important in the realization process we don't open further than we can tolerate mm. right and we release not into open space but into that internal ground of our being so we we right away feel that we're more of ourselves more of our emotional being more of our actual feel of power in our belly more of our voice more of our understanding so so we're releasing into our internal being so um so it doesn't i mean it of course initially takes courage it takes courage just to set out on any sort of path like this uh but it's but there are no alarming moments in it right you know, again, take courage in the process yeah um you know kind of going back to this idea of living in front of ourselves why do we do that? Why do we tend to do that? Well, several reasons. One, where we we learn how to relate to other human beings that way. You know, if our parents come, and this is most of us don't live in our bodies, so very likely our parents are coming out of themselves. Either that, or they're closed off, shut off, or they're coming way out. You know, so we also come out to meet them, right? Um, we also come out to concentrate, you know, children are need to memorize, you know, they're tested every few weeks on whatever they're learning. So we need to really focus and concentrate outside of ourselves. But the, the real reason, the big reason is, are these constrictions within the body that they actually don't allow us to make internal contact with ourselves. So mm -hmm. then we're we have to live outside of ourselves. It's actually a rare thing. And this is this is another just amazing fact about human nature. It's a rare thing that people are actually living within the internal space of their body. That's that's a mind body, consciousness body integration, right? It's really oneness, right? And then we actually experience ourselves as conscious everywhere in our body. That's a, it's an unusual state. It's not our usual, not our usual state. So people have been working towards experiencing that for thousands of years. It, it always has taken some amount of intentionality to do, to get there. It almost feels like we're, we're pushing our own selves outside of ourselves. Yeah. Um, oh, eh. And there's almost something sad about that, that we're right. Well, I mean, it, it just seems to go in a sense, go against who we are. Why yeah. are we, do we need, why can't we embody who we are? Why are we stepping outside of ourselves in order to relate to one another? Yes. there. You know, you could say it's sad if it weren't just the typical human condition, 
<laughs> and yet when when we meet someone, are we talking about a, an aspect of authenticity here or authenticity yes. in and of itself here, complete authenticity? Yes, that, that that's another thing I wanted to mention. Uh, besides taking up space and feeling our sense of existence, we also feel real. And, I, you know, it takes, uh, this again, probably takes some sensitivity to feel, but that awful feeling of, of not being real, you know, if it, you know, uh, you know, I have this mask. I, you know, if I go to a party, I have to be a certain way, and and we become aware of that. We become aware that something is not quite mm-hmm. real, and um, when we become aware of that, that's a that's a good that's a good step. Uh, when we inhabit the body and we uncover this uh, undivided ground of ourselves. Uh, we feel real. It feels, oh, this is finally who I really am. And we look around and even our our vision, not that, you know, not that we can see better. It's not, you know, it's not like wearing glasses, but but there is something about the world being as it, as it really is, you know, to some extent, right? More, you know, less, less projected upon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, less, less subjectively distorted. So, in terms of um, your, your your books, I mean, the first the "Fullness of the Ground," the guide to embodied awakening, trauma and the unbound body. Where does trauma come in in terms of the realization process? Right. So, I'm using the word trauma quite loosely. I'm using it in the realization process to mean anything that we were not able to fully experience. Right. So, if we were not able to fully mourn the loss of someone uh, as a child, if we were not able to to fully open to the sound of our parents' angry voices, for example, right? If we were not able to fully take in the smell of cigarette smoke or whiskey, uh, whatever, in our child childhood environment. It's usually when we're children that we mm-hmm. that we form ourselves in this way. Um, although as teenagers, you know, if we're not able to to take the looks that we're getting you know, at our our budding bodies, uh, and we have to shield ourselves in some way, uh, or or we actually are attacked or you know molested in some way. We definitely have to protect ourselves against that. So these are all, you know, this is a very good part of nature that we're able to protect ourselves in this way from being shattered. This mm-hmm. keeps us from being shattered, but at the same time. It does fragment us internally, right? So we cut off those those parts of ourselves that we constrict, we no longer in, in contact with. So we actually, to some extent, lose our emotional ability, our, emotion, our ability to feel love. We, to some extent, lose our mental clarity, sense of mental clarity. Uh, we, to some extent, lose the actual feel of power our good power within our body. Uh, we may lose our ability to feel sexual pleasure or to feel any sort of uh, tactile pleasure. Uh, so as we let go of these holding patterns and enter into ourselves more fully, all of this uh, richness of our own being and the corresponding richness of our perception of the world around us uh, comes comes into the fore. And um, all the, the the richness of emotions and, and and pain, I would assume, also comes That's up right. with that. That's right. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's not like we we never feel pain again. We, what we may get over is some of the the extra pain that's you know projected from our childhood, right? So the the many other losses. But if we lose someone th- that we love, yes, of course, we're going to feel pain. Uh, if something is really threatening us, we're going to feel fear, and we and we should feel fear, right? If something is oppressing us, we're going to feel anger, and we should feel anger. So, uh, yes, we get the the appropriate emotional ability, right? The ability to respond appropriately without that extra childhood. You know, I'm angry, and I'm so angry because of you know something that happened to me when I'm four. So now that you're making me angry, it's going to be 
horrific. Uh, we, you know, we, you know, that that starts to dissipate, but we still have our full and very nuanced emotional capacity, mm. which is, of course, the the richness of our lives. So as we kind of wind down here, Judith, um, uh, I, I know on your website, uh, you have events and programs. What's coming up for you? How are you working with people? Who are you teaching? Who are you helping? Um, I'm at this point uh, retired from private practice. I'm teaching workshops and teacher certification trainings in the work. Uh, there's actually a training starting October 6th, oh, okay. um, meditation training. There's three main trainings, the non-dual meditation aspect of the work, the embodiment aspect of the work, and the psychological healing, which they call healing ground aspect of the work. All of that is on the website, realizationprocess.org. Okay. Uh, and then I have wonderful uh, people who are teaching the work, who have been through all the trainings and have been teaching for many years. And all of their events are also listed on the website. We'll have that uh, listed up here at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Once again, uh, Judith Blackstone, her website is realizationprocess.org. Judith, thank you so much for being here. I mean, you are so inspiring. It's, oh. yeah, l- l- honor having you on here. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too.